Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Driven by Cause. I'd like to take a minute and give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Arriva and Meistersoft. Due to their continued support, we get to join you all today. Without further ado, let's get right into it. I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Jay Fisk. How are you doing today, Jay? David, as always, doing great. Glad to be joining you one more time on this podcast. Well, that's right, Jay. It's great to be back. And to make it even better, I'm going to introduce our special guest today. Melanie Lockwood Herman is the Executive Director of the Center for Nonprofit Risk Management. The center provides consulting services that help nonprofit management and leadership teams overcome risk aversion and embrace the bold risks their missions require. Melanie is the author of over 20 books and resource guides on various risk management topics. She has been named to the Nonprofit Times Power and Influence Top 50 list over 15 times. That's great, Melanie. She currently serves on the board of two national organizations, the American Foundation for the Blind and the National Humane Services Assembly. Melanie earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in the Urban Affairs from American University and a Juris Doctorate from George Mason University. She is also a member of the District of Columbia Bar Association. Welcome, Melanie, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Melanie, can you share with our listeners some of the information about yourself and how you got started in the nonprofit industry? I'd be happy to, David. So I moved to the D.C. area in the early 1980s to attend American University. It was my first time visiting D.C. when I when I moved to D.C. to, to actually locate and live in a dormitory at AU. And at the time, I think I thought I would wind up working in the public sector, so in some sort of government agency. But during my years at AU, I took a couple of paid internships working for nonprofits, and I really had an amazing introduction to the world of mission-driven organizations, and I was hooked. I saw an opportunity to make a contribution, but also make a good living at the same time. During my sophomore year in college at AU, my boss at one of my internships actually offered me a full-time job. I took that job and I wound up completing my undergraduate degree at night. And then I later went to law school as a, as a night student as well. Wow. <laughs> uh, very impressive uh, resume. Uh, we, we reviewed it ahead of time. And I, I, one of the questions I had was, what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> now, that's not an official question. You know, you're the executive director of the Nonprofit Risk Management Center, and uh, they provide management assistance. Uh, or, it's a management assistant organization and provide informational resources, technical assistance, and so forth, training to an estimated 20,000 nonprofit uh, annually. What are some of the biggest risks that you see nonprofits facing today? Yeah, that's a great question, Jay. You know, most people working in the nonprofit sector think that the biggest uh, risk or the biggest dangers lie on the outside of the organization, kind of in the world outside their doors. But the truth is that the greatest risks facing nonprofits actually live and percolate and fester inside an organization. And these risks exist because of decisions that have been made, because of the culture that exists, and in some cases, because of an unwillingness to change course when a, an adopted strategy proves ineffective. So from where I sit, and I have exposure to the risks of many different types of organizations, we work with really large international nonprofits, as well as some small local and regional and statewide nonprofits. But from where I sit, you know, with this vantage point to this incredible array of risks, I think the biggest risk facing nonprofits is failing to live up to, or the risk of failing to live up to, espoused values. And increasingly, mm. we're seeing nonprofits embracing and espousing values such as equity and inclusion and distributed leadership. And when an organization publicly proclaims its supports for those support for those values and its commitment to those values, but then it falls short, all sorts of disruption can result. 
I would say the second biggest risk facing nonprofits pretty consistently across the sector is a lack of preparedness for turnover. And we joke here on my team that turnover, you know, the risk of, of people leaving isn't really a risk at all. It's just a reality. But we don't know when people are going to leave. We don't know who's going to leave. And we don't really know the circumstances of their departures right, well in advance. But that lack of readiness for turnover is a risk that both very small organizations face, as well as huge organizations with thousands of employees face as well. And it really requires a commitment to document policies and procedures and roles and, and make sure that we're doing a lot of cross training so that when somebody leaves, somebody else is really ready to, to pick up that task and do the work. So I would say those are the two biggest risks that are pretty much universal across the nonprofit. Can I, can I follow up on your first one? Sure, uh, absolutely. Is is there a is there a um, a problem in the industry with organizations that are saying adopting a I'll call it a trend, but is not something that is not um, compatible with the culture of that organization? So they, you know, they they do it for political reasons. They do it for because it's a, it's a trend. It's the right thing to do, but the inherent culture of the organization that they built is incompatible with with that and so when they try and bring it into the organization it doesn't really work is that a, 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 do you encounter that you know, Jay, i don't see it exactly that way the way i see it is that leaders of nonprofit organizations are incredibly sincere when they ad adopt specific values when they try to be guided by values and not just the the ultimate cause so i see a tremendous amount of sincerity and commitment when boards get together and talk about these values and decide to you know, embrace them and be anchored in these values or principles. So I think it's sincere. I don't think it's in response to outside pressure or um, trying to appease external donors or ex external constituents. I think it's very sincere, but I think organizations kind of jump and embrace those values without having a plan to how they're gonna live up to those values, first of all, and second, without true awareness about the existing gap, you know, between how they describe the organization and what it feels like to work in the organization. Sometimes uh -huh. there's a gap between those two things. Yeah, thank you. Melanie, you've written more than 20 books on various topics of risk management. And one book in particular I like to talk about is No Surprises. Uh, harmonizing risk and reward in volunteer management. In the book, you emphasize that volunteer recruitment requires a sophisticated blend of risk-taking, risk awareness, and risk management. Can you speak more about the risk nonprofits face when working with volunteers and what nonprofits can do to ensure a successful volunteer program to further their mission? I'd be happy to. So No Surprises actually was the very first book that uh, the Nonprofit Risk Management Center published. And the first edition was published before I even arrived here. But I was the author of the, I think, the third, fourth, and fifth editions of that particular publication. So we really started as an organization that was focused on helping nonprofits understand and appreciate volunteer risks. The founder of NRMC, a gentleman by the name of Chuck Tremper, used to wear a button when he would go out and give presentations. And the button said, volunteers don't do it for free. Uh, I've never worn that button, but I, I understand the sentiment. Of volunteer service is the lifeblood of so many nonprofits. But with that work, that labor, that commitment that volunteers bring, really comes a variety of risks. Uh, most people that we work with who engage large teams of volunteers are worried about volunteers getting hurt on the job. And they're worried about volunteers causing harm, whether it's harm to other people or harm to systems or even harm to reputation. So um, at NRMC, we believe that there are some, some fundamentals to managing volunteers. And I wanna talk about three fundamentals. So the first one is, thoughtfully designed and clearly articulated volunteer roles. So my message here is don't recruit volunteers until you've given a lot of thought to what you need, what tasks are appropriate and will be appropriate um, to assign to these volunteers 
and how you will handle the inevitable bumps along the way. There will be issues that crop up when you engage volunteers and you need to be prepared for them. So thinking a lot, giving a great deal of thought and care to designing volunteer roles is super important. That would be my first fundamental. It's also kind of related to that topic, I would say, is making sure that you have two lanes. You have the employee lane and you have the volunteer lane and that you don't mix up the two. Sometimes nonprofit leaders, especially in, in smaller organizations, try to economize by having a single handbook that applies to both employees and volunteers. That's a terrible idea. We want to have two different lanes. They're very different roles. They should have different rules, uh, different training, different expectations, and so forth. So my second fundamental is every organization that engages volunteers needs to have some clear, really thoughtful policies that will change and evolve and flex as the organization grows and as it learns. So as you work with volunteers, you gather all this incredible experience and insights um, from that those interactions, and you want to update your policies to reflect those insights. One of the things we've seen time and time again that, that is a mistake is overwhelming volunteers with a, a lengthy, convoluted set of policies. When you do that, it, it often backfires. And what happens, and this happens to all of us when we're presented with a long contract or a document that has a requirement to sign at the bottom, what happens is a volunteer will just skim right to the bottom and sign the document without taking even a minute to review those policies and and really think about and reflect on whether those policies make sense and whether they are committed to following them. Mm -hmm. One of the techniques that a lot of organizations are using, some of our clients are using, and we applaud this, is presenting policies in an online format where the volunteer has to read a sentence, maybe a couple of sentences or a paragraph, and then click to agree before that person moves on to the next policy or the next expectation. So it's a form of click-through agreement that requires you to kind of go slowly and pause and read each section. So I love that. So clear, thoughtful policies is my second fundamental. And then my third fundamental is effective supervision and coaching. You know, when we set volunteers loose on an organization and expect them to uh, work safely and effectively, we're being very naive. We all need oversight. Even the most experienced nonprofit CEOs need a great board to provide oversight. So all volunteers that you might engage need oversight, and we need to make the commitment if we're going to engage volunteers, we want them to have a great experience. We want that experience to be safe. We want them to feel that they've contributed to our missions, but we need to train them. We need to be clear about roles. And we need to support them as they go and provide great uh, supervision and oversight. So those would be my kind of three fundamentals of, of managing volunteers safely and effectively. And I think that uh, um, those fundamentals really apply to any organization, one that engages maybe a dozen or more volunteers over the short term to an organization that's bringing in thousands of volunteers working over months or years. And I like the click through idea. You, you encounter that in a lot of contracts if you're buying a home and you're doing something, you know, through DocuSign or whatever, they make it really clear that you understand what you're signing. And I, I was a, that's a terrific point. The organizations that, that you work with uh, don't <clears throat> want to leave their success to chance, which is one of the reasons why they hire you, obviously. So for those nonprofits that are listening, uh, what can what sort of tip can you give them uh, that would ensure their long term uh, success if they want to become a resilient organization? You know, where should they start? That's a great question. I, you know, I think risk management in today's world and in today's reality must be grounded in or anchored to building resilience. No organization, no matter how large it is, no matter how old it is, no matter how successful it is or beloved it is, no organization can completely avoid surprises or disruption or, or difficulty. And so trying to eliminate risk is, is really a is wasted effort. Uh, what we wanna do is focus on building resilience, being prepared. And I think building resilience really begins with being prepared should the people, should the materials, should the methods, should the resources, or even the funding that you depend on today be, becomes unavailable for any reason tomorrow. So 
resilience is all about identifying those things that are core to your success, core to your mission, core to your operations, and imagining that any number of those things um, might not be available tomorrow, might be disrupted for any reason, reasons beyond your control to prevent. What would you do in thinking about what you would do to cope? What would you do to handle this situation if, if a person isn't available, if a system isn't available, if supplies aren't available, if a facility isn't available? And that kind of work is sometimes called business continuity planning, but it really is all about building resilience, the ability to bounce back and continue that mission despite an interruption that you are unable to avoid. So to me, it all comes back to resilience. One of my, the board members that was on the board that hired me many years ago, at one point he, he made a comment that risk management is resilience. It's, it comes down to, it's based on, it's focused on, it revolves around building resilience. And he said that 20 years ago, uh, well before the term resilience was, was something that was spoken about frequently and, and became part of the vocabulary of leadership and, and of risk management. Melanie, you've been the architect behind some of the risk management plans for the nation's leading nonprofits today. Uh, having worked with nonprofits of all sizes, what are the differences in risk management plans for a large as opposed to a small? Should it be the same? Should it be different? Could you share a little bit more on that? Absolutely. Great question, uh, David. I think there are far more similarities than differences. And as an example, our team has been working during the past year to build a, a new website that's filled with free resources on risk and HR. And it's a, the website is risk-resources.org. And as, as we finish one of the resources on the site, and there are, I think, about 50 resources on the site, now all free, super accessible, straightforward materials. But as we complete each resource, we often reflect that wow, this was created to help small nonprofits, but large nonprofits would probably get a lot of benefit out of this as well. And so we're finding that lots of larger nonprofit teams are going to that website and using those resources. So I think there are more similarities and differences. One of the misconceptions that many people have about small versus large nonprofits is that large organizations have unlimited resources. The truth is that no nonprofit has unlimited resources. No nonprofit has unlimited resources. And every penny spent by a nonprofit is someone else's money. And that means we have an ethical obligation to be effective stewards, effective fiduciaries of the funds that we receive to deliver our mission. So going back to your question, the risk management plan or approach of a large nonprofit it is different from that of a small nonprofit, mainly because it probably has a lot of uh, fingerprints on it, right? The fingerprints of many different people and teams. So individuals from operations to programs to communications, development, IT, HR, finance, individuals from across the organization in these different functions probably had a hand in creating the risk management plan. Whereas the risk management plan of a small nonprofit is likely to be written by a single person who wears many hats, right? The executive director or the CEO of a very small nonprofit. I think that's the biggest difference is the number of people who are involved, but both of the, those plans are likely to cover lots of different possibilities and scenarios. And the best thing is that a risk management plan is an opportunity to write down your philosophy about risk, who's responsible for risk, and how you go about identifying and taking action on risk. So I think there are a lot more similarities and differences, but with a larger organization, I, I just see many more sets of fingerprints on the final document. Yeah, but it's the risk uh, management center, your risk management center uh, offers uh, various services for consulting and coaching nonprofits. And uh, one of the services offered, uh, and this is kind of, I find this kind of intriguing, is called risk appetite coaching. Uh, in which you guide organizations on how to empower their members to take appropriate risks to achieve uh, to achieve their mission and strategic goals. Can you provide some examples of uh, risk appetite and how uh, how a nonprofit uh, you know might employ that uh, with their members uh, and how they get them to participate in risk appetite coaching or risk appetiting, I should say. Sure, I'd be happy to address that. So risk appetite refers to the amount of risk 
an organization is willing to take or bear to achieve its strategic priorities, how much risk it's willing to take to achieve its strategic priorities. And the sense of my team is that many nonprofits, maybe most nonprofits are too cautious. They're too risk averse. And what we want organizations to do, leadership teams to do, and this is often something that the board of directors does, or the senior management team does in, in concert with the board, we want them to reflect on the importance of their mission and how embracing risk could advance that mission further. Mm -hmm. um, some teams, as you kind of help them with risk appetite and defining risk appetite, and thinking about risk appetite, some teams become more comfortable advocating big bets, right? Embracing those big risks. And that's ultimately what risk appetite coaching is all about. You know, for some organizations, the, the concept of risk appetite refers to a series of statements. We have a bold appetite when it comes to X. We are cautious when it comes to Y. So many nonprofits have adopted a series of statements like that. We don't advocate that. We think that that ends up being a piece of paper that nobody ever refers to. What we believe is really helpful is some sort of framework, um, a process that, a, that an individual can use, somebody who's making a decision, a process they can use or some steps or some questions they can ask themselves when they're making a decision to just clarify that the decision they're about to make is within the nonprofit's risk appetite. And why that's important is that if I'm a decision maker and I'm making a decision way off in a program somewhere in a different part of the world, I want to know that no matter how it turns out, I will be supported in that decision. So even if it turns out horribly wrong, as long as I made the decision and it was within the nonprofit's risk appetite, I will be supported. So I'm not going to get in a lot of trouble because it didn't turn out well, because I was acting within the risk appetite. But anyone who makes decisions in a nonprofit needs to have an understanding of what the organization's risk appetite is in any number of areas. And, and that's super important, especially now, because so many organizations are adopting what's called distributed leadership, which is pushing decision making down to people that are closest to the issue. Yeah. So in some of the international nonprofits we work with, people working in local offices around the world are able to make decisions, but they need to be supported in those decisions. And I think one of the best ways to empower good decision making is to coach members of the team um, around this issue of risk appetite. Could you give us just a quick example of a risk that might fall within that risk appetite uh, envelope? Sure. So um, with many of the international organizations we work with, they wind up opening offices and delivering programs in, in pretty dangerous parts of the world. And so while an organization that is not in the humanitarian space or helping people in the wake of, you know, earthquakes and disasters, you know, might not want to open an office in that area. An organization that's mission is to help people in crisis, people that are, are, are coping with the ravages of war and civil unrest and, and so forth, natural disasters. An organization that has that mission needs to be in those dangerous places. So that organization is going to have a very big appetite to be in a place where the risk of harm to its people it exists. It's a reality. It's a reality. Uh, we have several, several organizations we're working with that have teams and offices and operations in Ukraine. And of course, there's so much danger there as, as well as in any other places in the world. So that type of organization is going to have a bigger appetite for danger and harm because it has to be in those dangerous places in order to do the work that it was established to do. Great. Thank you for the clarity. Well, there's so many different areas of risk, and your organization also coaches nonprofit organizations on another risk, cyber risk, and it's more from a holistic perspective. What are some of the cyber threats nonprofits face today, and how can organizations take the necessary steps to defend themselves from the cyber risk or cyber absolutely. threats? Cyber threats, absolutely. So the two biggest, I think, most feared cyber threats are breaches of protected information, such as personally identifiable information, or PII, or protected health information, which is PHI. The second one is damage to systems from an intrusion. And many people really fear uh, the bad actors working in the cyber crime industry, which we know is a huge industry, it's a growth industry. 
And there are millions of people all around the world who are trying to steal information and assets through some sort of cyber crime um, enterprise. But the truth is that most cyber incidents are triggered by somebody who leaves a door open. And that could be due to lack of a firewall, lack of adequate password protocols, or someone just hurrying to do their job and to read and respond to lots of emails. So the most important thing that, that all of us can do to guard against these intrusions and breaches is to remind the people that we work with over and over again to be cautious. And, and a great rule of thumb is if it seems suspicious, it is suspicious, right? If it seems suspicious, it is suspicious. And if you're guided by that, you're less likely to click on something, open a file that's corrupted or that is basically opening the door to a cyber criminal. Another yeah. tip that we recommend is if your organization is purchasing cyber liability insurance, we want you to go back and look at the application form. Insurance providers are now asking lots of questions about what a policyholder is doing to guard against uh, these risks. And I think it's a great idea to go back to the application and look at all of the questions and especially focus on the questions where you answered no. We don't have that in place. We don't do that. And do some research to look into what would it cost? What would it take to do that to be able to answer yes next year? And so it gives you a very quick list, a to-do list of things to, that you can, mm -hmm. um, steps you can take, measures you can put in place to reduce the, the likelihood of a breach. And uh, rest assured, next year's application will have additional questions. Insurers are getting more and more sophisticated about this particular risk because they're facing just an incredible growth in the number of claims and increasingly sophisticated attacks. So whatever you're doing now won't be enough next year. Whatever you're doing next year won't be enough the year after. So we have to be increasingly risk aware and increasingly vigilant. All right, Melanie, we talked a lot about your work and uh, you've given some great tips. Uh, I want to shift gears on you a little bit. Um, what is something that our audience might find interesting to learn about you personally? So I think your audience might be surprised to hear that when I was five years old, I was the registered owner of a 1941 Piper J4 Cub Coop aircraft. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I didn't expect that, right? My you know, parents immigrated. I want to fly it. I could tell. You, I I could probably fly it. I'd love to. Love to fly. It's an amazing. It's an amazing wow. plane. So my parents immigrated from England in 1964. We joke in our family that the Beatles followed my parents to America, um, and my dad purchased this plane for a few hundred dollars back in 1970. And when he went to register the plane at the registry of aircraft. He found out that at that time, only American citizens could own private aircraft in the United States. So he asked the person at the desk, he was dismayed, of course, he just bought this, this plane. And he asked the person at the desk, must the owner, or the, the registered owner be 18 years of age? And she said, no. And he said, I'll be right back. So he drove home to pick me up took me back to the vehicle registry office and I became the official registered owner of that plane. And we owned that plane for five years. And throughout that time, I loved flying with my dad. This is a two seat aircraft, kind of side by side, a very small aircraft. I loved the ups and downs and I loved wind gusts. And what's funny today is that when I'm on a commercial flight, I actually enjoy turbulence and not too many people do, but it always kind of brings me back to flying in that yeah. super small aircraft with my dad. Did you ever get a license yourself and just have a desire to go fly? You know, I I thought when I was very young, when I was five or six, that, that I would become a commercial pilot. That was absolutely yeah. something I was interested in. And um, my dad took me to... Um, a civil air patrol meeting to, to try to encourage me to join this, this youth organization and, and get a feel for it. And I just, I was just put off because obviously like so many organizations, it was very structured and everybody had uniforms. And I was used to flying with my dad in that little plane and just, just having so much fun. And it, it, uh, 
yeah, I decided not to go in that direction, but I love to fly. I have friends who own aircraft and I fly for work a lot and I absolutely love to fly in all sorts of aircraft, but I never did uh, get a license. Well, thank you so much for sharing that to personalize. And you're right. There's nobody on this podcast who would have guessed that. <laughs> it's one. not in my bio. So it's one of those but, things that, that yeah. comes up once in a while. But but Melanie, he certainly set the journey for your life. You yeah. like the ups and downs and the yeah. turbulence and uh and your consulting firm is perfect spot on of navigating yeah. people through risk. So yeah. that's really awesome. Um, we always like to finish our show by asking one question. And it's sort of on the same thing that Jane, something about being surprised. But what's something that we didn't ask you that we wish we had asked you? Yeah, I love I love that question. I think one for me might be, you know, what are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned from a mentor or a role model? And I've had so many in my life. I mentioned one um, who taught me that risk management is all about resilience. That was Felix Kloman, who was a member of my board many years ago. But recently I've come to the realization that I think some of the most powerful leadership lessons I've learned over the years are, are ones that I've learned from my dad. Uh, he was just an amazing human being. He believed in leading with trust and he would never expect somebody to earn his trust. And he once said to me that in life, you can either trust people and occasionally be disappointed, or you can mistrust people generally. And in doing so, miss the opportunity to be a, a true friend and to learn from others. And he leaned on trusting everybody until somebody you know, squattered that trust. Um, he also believed deeply in something that we, we call today, we refer to it as servant leadership. And as a boss, and he, he was fortunate to be a, a boss and a business owner um, during his lifetime, he was really on a mission to help people be their best. And he did whatever it took to help people grow and learn and laugh and enjoy being part of a team. And he spent so much time, I think far more time planning parties and praising a job well done than he ever did telling people what to do or how to do it. And even though he was brilliant in, in my book, uh, he was absolutely determined to learn from everyone he met. And, and I really try to, to be that type of leader who's constantly learning and is focused on helping others be their best and to, to learn and to grow. Well, it sounds like you had, um, uh, you were very fortunate to have somebody behind you giving you that type of experience and leadership and guidance, because I don't think it's just being subservient to others, but I think it's leading in a different way that's very positive. So that's that's really awesome. Uh, Melanie, thank you for your time today. We'll be right back after this message. We are a team that has had an enduring influence on the nonprofit industry for more than three decades. We pride ourselves on developing and delivering technology with a purpose. Software born of a genuine understanding and passion for cause. We are relentlessly dedicated to our client's success. We are with our clients for good. We are Ariva, tech with purpose, driven by cause. Ariva is the trusted advisor and market leader of fundraising, donor relationship management, and auction software and services. Exceed further, our evolutionary all-in-one digital fundraising and donor relationship management software is helping nonprofits worldwide further their mission, transform fundraising, and cultivate relationships with donors and constituents. Our Maestro Auction virtual, live, and silent auction software, text to bid virtual and mobile bidding software, and text-to-fund, text-based donation software are helping nonprofits raise billions of dollars through thousands of virtual fundraising events, charity auctions, and galas. Visit Ariva.com and reach out today and see how Ariva can help your nonprofit organization go further. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back for the next part of our show. We're going to hear from you, the audience. Jay, tell them what time it is. <laughs> That's right, David and Melanie. It's uh, it's Ask the Maestro time. Uh, this is the time uh, where we ask our listening audience to send in their question that they'd like to have us answer for them. And often we ask our guests to answer the question. And so uh, this particular uh, question comes from uh, Johanna. And uh, she writes saying, our organization has been noticing a decrease 
in the number of recurring gifts and an increase in one-time donations. How can we increase the amount of recurring and monthly uh, donations? And uh, I think that's a perfect setup for you, Melanie. Why don't you go ahead and give us what, how you might help, and then uh, maybe David and I will chime in with our opinions. Sure, that's a, a great question. I think the landscape of um, philanthropy has changed so dramatically in the last decade, especially in the last decade, but probably over the last um, uh, several decades. Yeah. When I began my career, one of my first jobs was as a development director. So I began in fundraising, working in a nonprofit. That was my primary function was raising money. I think the biggest challenge is that Many people are raising money using the same methods, strategies, and approaches they were using 10 or 15 years ago, and they simp they don't work any longer because the donor community has changed. If you talk to somebody who's in their, their 20s or 30s about how they want to give, they're probably less likely to be drawn to a recurring donation than somebody who's my generation or, or older. So... The donor community has changed, and yet we're still using some of the same methods and strategies. So I think it's really important to, to step back and put everything on the table and ask, what are we raising money for? Um, who are the primary donors today? How is that likely to change as demographics change and as some of our donors kind of age out of our um, system and pass on? And I think it's, it's almost uh, important today to, to leave no stone unturned, but to stop making big assumptions that today's donors are going to have the same motivations and want to use the same methods as donors of yesteryear. Yeah. And uh, David, do you have any two cents on that? If not, I'll give you my, my one and a half cents. Um, no, Jay, go ahead. I, I do have a, I have a lot of opinions on this front, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think you nailed it. The, the demographic of, uh, of uh, supporters is completely changing, as we, we all know. In the auction arena, we always, uh, during an auction, we do something called a raise the paddle or emotional appeal or fund a need, you know, uh, stand up for kids, whatever. They're all, it all means the same thing. And that's during the auction, we ask people to make a donation. We start with a big amount and we work our way down to a smaller amount. I think the mistake that a lot of organizations make is they think that that's the only time they're going to do their big fundraising. And I would encourage them to go back to the person who raised their paddle at 5,000 or raised their paddle at 2,500 or even 1,000 and say, we appreciate your one-time generosity at our event. Would you be willing to let us convert that to a quarterly donation on an ongoing basis? You donated $2,500. Could we split that into four payments and, and make that an ongoing so that we start next year with your commitment for next year? So I think that's an opportunity for organizations to at least plant the seed with those one-time donations at an event to be, become a recurring donation. So that would be my two cents. Yeah, no, Jay, I think that's, I, I think, I, I love the subject because I think it's really important. Yeah. And I think organizations, you know, are, are always focused on the donation pieces and, you know, getting donations. We, we did a whole subject on donor engagement and I think donor engagement and donor acquisition and donor retention sort of all fall into this. And, and it really is, are you giving the same message that you're giving to somebody, you know, in one generation, that same type of a message in another that would be compelling enough where they just don't want to give just a one-time donation. But I think that really folds into a lot of different aspects of, you know, keeping people up to date about what their donation actually did. You know, if they moved it from a one-time or an annual donation to a reoccurring donation and how that impacts them, and the difference that even if it's five dollars or ten dollars, because if you can get lots of people giving the five and ten dollars, you're going to have a lot. But it's also about that engagement and 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 really sharing. And I I, I think the more that, that we, the organizations and these nonprofits share about the impact that it has, and it's not just the dollars; it's it's the programs that they're running, it's the food services that they're providing, it's it's the meals that they're giving out, and you know, did, did they did they miss, you know, one less family? And if you had a reoccurring donation, how that could be impactful. I think these impact reports that I've seen, I don't see enough of them. I mean, I know they submit certain things to the IRS and what you have to do, but if you're in, if you're really showing and then acknowledging their, their gifts and, and acknowledgement is so important. It's not just a thank you. It's not just an email. It's not an automatic thank you, but it's, it's all those other things about acknowledgement and, and building walls and, I think it's just 
moves on and on about like what you said, it's consistency of, of sending those messages. And yeah. I think if you do that, your reoccurring could potentially increase, uh, but it's a lot of different things. And we do have some great subjects on that as well, but it's a, it, it's probably a lot longer than a, a two minute conversation here. Well, that's all the time we have for the Ask, Ask the Maestro segment. Uh, if you uh, would like to submit your questions to Ask the Maestro, perhaps it'll show up on a future podcast and you could submit your questions to us. We'd love to love to hear from you. And uh, David, I think we're kind of coming to the end of this particular episode, aren't we? Yes, we are. Well, thank you, Jay. And I want to especially thank Melanie for our great insight and for being here with us today. It was fabulous having you, Melanie. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for our listeners, make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on all the new episodes and content. I also want to give special thank you to our amazing sponsors, like Jay just mentioned again, Ariva and Mastersoft. We're so proud to be partners with them on this podcast. And last, but certainly not least, thank you to all of our fantastic listeners. We hope you'll join us next time on Driven by Cause and make it a great day. Thank you.